Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and we're taking a look today at the new MacBook Air. Now this looks exactly like the old MacBook Air, but inside it's a lot different. It's got the Apple M1 processor and this really is a big deal. This is not the fastest laptop you're going to buy by any stretch, but it is the fastest fanless laptop that I have ever seen. And I think it's going to really set the bar for the PC industry rolling forward. And the one that I went with here has the same processor as the MacBook Pro 13 and the desktop Mac Mini. So it should give you a pretty good idea as to what you can expect out of this new Apple chip. They've really implemented this quite well and there are not many compromises here. And we're gonna take a deep dive into this in just a second, but I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new Apple architecture is all about. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. And I have to say that right out of the gate, I was very disappointed that Apple didn't do anything different on the physical hardware side. This is exactly the same casing as the MacBook Air you could have bought a year ago. And I think they could have done something a little bit thinner and lighter. I've talked about this before on my channel, but I am a big fan of the 12 inch MacBook. I've had this one now for five years. I love how thin and light it is. It's a nice little Mac, but it is really slow. And if they had put this processor inside of this one, it would have been a really awesome little portable PC. But instead, they kind of played it safe here and just put the guts inside of their existing MacBook Air shell. Uh, the MacBook Pro 13 and the Mac Mini are largely in the same cases as their Intel equivalents. And the result here is a laptop that is very thin and light, as you can see, but I think it could have been made thinner and lighter. Uh, so this is 2.8 pounds or 1.29 kilograms and it's got a really nice 13.3 inch display. And the display is running with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. This is nice because you get a little bit more height to the display while still being wide. So you can work on documents and fill the whole screen up with that document. This is of course an Apple Retina display. The resolution is 2560 by 1600. When you have it in the default scaling setting here, you're gonna get about 227 pixels per inch, which looks really, really nice. I like to run mine with the more space option here so I can fit more on the screen. Uh, so that'll be a little bit less on the PPI, but I can fit more and that's important to me. And you can jump into your display settings to make those adjustments. It's pretty bright. It runs at 400 nits. Uh, which isn't bad for a entry level uh, laptop. You've got to scale things properly here when you're talking about Apple's entry level. Uh, so that's good for a starting point. And then of course the MacBook Pro, which costs a little bit more, has a brighter display. So if you want something brighter than 400 nits, that's probably the way to go. This supports Apple True Tone, which will try to keep the colors consistent when uh, you're under different ambient lighting conditions. It looks really nice. I've left that on. I've got that on my phone and some of my other Apple devices as well. And altogether, it feels like a nice Apple display, which uh, I would expect out of them for this price point. Now, inside of this laptop, I have the Apple M1 processor, of course. And on the MacBook Air, there are two processor options. They have one with a seven core GPU and another one with the eight core GPU. I went with the eight core version, which is the higher end of the two. And that'll give you a little bit more graphical performance. And given that I do a lot of video editing, I thought that would be important to have. I also outfitted mine with 512 gigs of storage and 16 gigabytes of RAM. And this of course being an Apple product, you cannot upgrade anything inside of it. So the RAM and storage are all locked in from the moment you buy it. And my advice would be to probably go with a 16 gigabyte version, especially if you plan to keep it for a number of years. I tend to use my Apple products until they die given their cost. And so I figured I would get this one for the long haul because it will be uh, replacing another machine that I'm using in my workflow. Now the keyboard and trackpad on here are also very nice and it's really nice to finally be able to say that Apple has a nice keyboard on a laptop after the last four years or so. Uh, my MacBook Pro has been in the shop at least two or three times for keyboard issues and it's about to go back in again. Uh, this keyboard is not using that old butterfly design that was causing a lot of issues. They kind of went back to the drawing board on it and it's actually a much better keyboard. It has really nice travel to it. The keys push down really far. Uh, the keys are very nicely spaced. I've been really enjoying typing on this keyboard. It is super nice. 
Uh, it is backlit. Hopefully it'll hold up over the long haul here. They always feel nice when you first get them, so I'll let you know if we have any trouble with the keyboard down the road. Uh, the trackpad, though, is great, and Apple has been making great trackpads over the last five or six years. This is a solid-state trackpad. It doesn't click at all, even though it feels like it's clicking when you click on it, and it does it all through a little haptic feedback motor inside. And as a result of it being solid state, you can click anywhere on the pad. So it's really good. It ignores things that you don't intend to do with it. And I've always loved the Apple trackpads. And this one, of course, is just as good as all the other ones out there. It's got nice speakers here on the top. Uh, stereo, of course, it sounds really nice. Uh, this, of course, is not a tablet. So your display will go uh, down to about here. It won't go past that. Uh, but it is very well balanced, so when you go and lift up the display here, as you can see, it doesn't take the keyboard with it. Apple's always done a nice job with that. What's also kind of cool that, is that when you lift up the display here, it instantly turns itself on from sleep. It is super fast to restore uh, when it's sleeping. That's pretty nice. On the side here, we've got two Thunderbolt 4 ports, and if I'm not mistaken, this is the first non-Intel device with them, I think. And these are multifunction ports, so this is how you charge the laptop. It's got a 30-watt charger in the box, uh, but these will also allow you to send display out to a monitor. We're going to be doing that in a few minutes. And then, of course, you can plug in data devices, either Thunderbolt uh, or USB, into it. And, of course, it supports USB Type-C uh, 10 gigabit devices and the 40 gigabit Thunderbolt devices. A little bit earlier, I hooked it up to a docking station that I have upstairs. That docking station supplies power, and then it's got a bunch of ports on it. And then I have a 10 gigabit Ethernet adapter daisy chained off of that. And I was able to get everything to work on this one just like it does on my MacBook Pro. So these ports are fully functional, in my testing at least. Uh, one thing, though, that doesn't work with this laptop at the moment are eGPUs, external GPUs that you might plug into it. I use one of those on my Mac Mini, an Intel Mac Mini on the other side of my room here. Uh, that did not work on this one. I'm not sure if it's a hardware limitation or a software limitation, but if you were planning to buy this and plug a GPU into it, at the moment, at the time I'm recording this video, uh, these laptops don't support that, even though the older Intel versions do. Now, just like the prior edition of the MacBook Air, there are only two Thunderbolt ports here on the left-hand side. Uh, you do, though, get a headphone jack on the right-hand side, which is always nice to see. And, of course, this supports Bluetooth headphones and Apple's headphone protocol for the AirPods if you want to use those. Now, both the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air have a fingerprint reader on the right-hand side that doubles as a power switch. So when you go to unlock your computer, it should be pretty quick. You just tap your finger on there and you are in. Uh, you can also use that for verification in other applications as well that support it. Uh, it does not, however, support Face ID, so you cannot use facial recognition to unlock. Only the fingerprint works on this one. Uh, the webcam is up here. Nothing spectacular. It is a 720p webcam, but the processor does do some image processing here, so it does look a little nicer, perhaps, than some of the other uh, 720p MacBook cameras, but they're not spectacular. It's not up to the par of what a 1080p camera might be, and it kind of is in keeping with Apple really just focusing on the processor in this new generation of Macs and leaving pretty much everything else the same as the prior generation. Now, Apple says the battery life on this is going to be about 15 to 18 hours, depending on what you're doing. And I think if you keep the display brightness at a reasonable level around the midpoint and stick to the basics like word processing and email and some web browsing and maybe some YouTube or Netflix watching, you will probably get close to that 15 hour mark, if not exceed it. I was surprised just in the work I've been doing on this laptop over the last uh, day or so that it really does not drain when you're doing those basic tasks. I was doing web browsing and email and keynote presentations, and it was just staying steady in the 90 percentile range uh, throughout a pretty long duration of about three hours or so, and I was really impressed with that. I did edit some 4K video on it on battery. That certainly ate into it a lot faster, but even then, I think you will still see better battery life editing 4K videos on this laptop versus another laptop running with a less efficient processor. So the battery uh, is really a big deal here. And if you are looking for something that has fewer compromises, yet longer battery life, 
uh, this is probably something you're going to want to look at. All right, let's take a look now and see how this thing performs. We're going to load up Safari here on battery and just go visit the NASA.gov homepage. And as you can see, everything is really quick and snappy on this device. It really feels nice. And we're not on Ethernet. We're just on my standard AC Wi-Fi right now. And as you can see, things just render in super fast here. And it's really feeling like a, a super quick experience. And we've got some benchmarks we'll look at in a minute that will show us exactly how fast everything is here. But by and large, this has been a great browsing experience without question. And it also does a pretty nice job with YouTube. We've got a 1080p 60 video running here. No drop frames. It looks like the Safari browser is decoding everything properly. So I think YouTube and Netflix and of course all the other video services that you might want to watch on it uh, should function just fine uh, through this new M1 processor. All in really good stuff. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test running under Google Chrome, we got a score of 358.4 on version 1.0 of that test and 211.2 on version 2.0. That is the highest score we've ever recorded for a laptop here on the channel. Uh, the next highest one was the new Dell XPS 13 we looked at just a few weeks ago with an Intel Tiger Lake processor. But you can see here the Apple M1 is far exceeding that on this benchmark. And we were running the new M1 enhanced version of Chrome for the new Mac here. And I found that other applications that I use day to day like Pages here and Keynote are all really fast and responsive. Uh, this is their word processing application. This is M1 Optimize. And just look how quick everything is here as I'm moving stuff around. It is just zero latency, super fast. It's the kind of day-to-day -day performance that you would expect to see out of a higher end Mac, maybe not the lower end ones, but this one is just feeling great. And what's funny is having used this now for a while, uh, my MacBook Pro that I bought about four years ago, really feels sluggish by comparison. Everything from the menus to uh, moving images around here, everything is just so much quicker on this M1 versus my Intel MacBook Pro that I might actually start using this as my daily driver just because it feels so quick to me. Uh, I also loaded up Final Cut Pro and did a bunch of tests on it earlier. And what we'll do real quick here is load up a little 4K video I've been playing with in Final Cut Pro. This is just on the desktop here. I've got a bunch of 4K 60 video files loaded in. Two of them are HDR videos shot on the iPhone 12 Pro. So I have a filter on it right now to convert that HDR to SDR video. So you can see how blown out it gets when I turn that filter off. And this is not pre-rendered here. So if you look at these little dots here at the top of the timeline, uh, you'll see that it's just running uh, basically in real time here to do that color grading. And what we can do in addition to that is maybe drop in a little transition here. So we'll do that. And if we run that, you can see that's running nice and smooth. It was a little bit sluggish there when it ran. And the reason why it's just a little bit sluggish is that I have it on the better quality mode here. But as you can see, without any rendering, we're able to really work with this quite nicely. Again, a few drop frames there with that movement, but not bad at all. I can then maybe apply another filter here. Maybe we'll drop in this vintage thing here and see how that looks. Uh, but overall, editing 4K 60 video on this fanless laptop is going pretty nicely here. And we've seen similar performance out of this processor uh, series or family on the iPad Pro uh, because that one was able to edit 4K video pretty effortlessly. And now we're looking at more advanced tools being available to us on the Mac side uh, namely Final Cut Pro. I've been really impressed with the Final Cut Pro performance. Now, typically the videos I edit here on the channel are at 1080p at 30 frames per second. And what was immediately noticeable to me was just how much zippier things felt here on this MacBook Air versus my uh, MacBook Pro that I've been using for a couple of years now. It really does feel a lot quicker. And some other stuff is actually a lot faster too because right now my editor is off-site due to the pandemic. So what I usually do is take the raw files here, which are ProRes files, and convert them into something smaller that I can send to him over the internet. So what we do is we transcode these videos into proxy files, and we take about 20 to 25 gigabytes of raw footage and convert it down into proxies that are much smaller. And typically I'm sending him a package that's about 500 to 800 megabytes. It's a lot faster to send them that than 25 gigabytes. And then he edits the file and sends it back to me. And it's a really good workflow that's worked great for us. 
So I was curious to see how fast the MacBook Air here could transcode those files over to the proxy format versus a Mac Mini that we have here in the studio. That's the one that my editor typically uses when he's here in the studio with us. It's a 6-core i7, an 8700B that we bought about a year or two ago. And you can see the head-to-head -head test here running that we did on a live stream the other day. So the MacBook Air is on the left. And it's going to finish transcoding all of those files over in about 2 minutes and 14 seconds. You can see it wrapping up right there. And then on the right is the screen grab from the Mac Mini with that i7 chip, the 6-core chip. And that one took a bit longer. It didn't finish up until about 3 minutes and 32 seconds in that little test that we ran, which was pretty remarkable, actually. So this was faster than that 6-core Intel chip from just a year or two ago. And then what we did is we rendered out the project to the video format that I upload to YouTube. And for a few minutes, the MacBook Air here was ahead of the Intel on that processing. But because this is a fanless device and the only way it can cool itself down is by slowing down, they ended up processing that video at a, almost exactly the same amount of time, about six minutes and 10 seconds. So I think if I had the MacBook Pro 13 or the new Mac Mini with the M1 processor, we would have seen that export go a lot quicker. And I think that's the big difference here between the MacBook Air and the Pro. You'll get really good bursty performance out of this thing, like the proxy rendering we just did, but for a longer term, high duration, high stress kind of processing, the devices with active cooling are going to be faster. So I think if that's the kind of work that you're doing, a lot of sustained uh, kind of processing, you'll want to go with the MacBook Pro for a laptop or the Mac Mini on the desktop side. Now, another fun little benchmark we run with Final Cut Pro here is the Bruce X benchmark. And this is just a real simple little Final Cut Pro project that renders out a 5K video but it really works your system's GPU because there's a ton of effects and transitions and titles going on. And if you have a computer without a GPU, it takes a while for it to render. So the prior version of the MacBook Air here, the Intel one that we reviewed about two years ago, uh, took about three minutes to render out that very short file. I'll show you what it looks like when it's done here. Uh, so really quick little file, three minutes on the old one. This one did it in 18 seconds. Isn't that remarkable? And what was also interesting is that we often hook up an external GPU to the Mac Mini over there. And when that GPU is attached, it's an RX 580, uh, the Mac Mini will render it out with the GPU in 20 seconds. So that's not you know, the most recent modern AMD GPU, but it's still pretty crazy to see that kind of graphical performance out of a single chip solution like this little computer here. And that's just the kind of performance that we're seeing out of this. And the crazy thing was that the MacBook Air here barely got warm. It has never been hot to the touch ever. And that's not something I have ever seen with a fanless laptop before. You'll feel a little bit of warmth like in this area of the keyboard, uh, but by and large, it is mostly cool to the touch. It never gets hot, even when you're exporting videos or running benchmarks or anything else like that. I did hook up a kilowatt to it, and the maximum power draw I saw was just under 30 watts when one of those benchmarks were running. So Apple has really put together a super efficient chip here. Now the M1 chip on this new Mac is the same processor family that runs iPads and iPhones, and you can install many iPhone and iPad apps on your Mac if the developer wants you to. So if you go in and search for something that you want to try out, just go and run that search and then click on iPhone and iPad apps to see if it's compatible. Another thing you can do is click on your account here in the lower left-hand corner and go over to iPhone and iPad apps and it'll pull up a list of everything that you have installed on your iPhone that's compatible with your Mac, and you can install those apps and get them working here. So I did put a few on here already. Uh, so for example, the uh, Wise app that I run for my security cameras and my light bulbs here is compatible with uh, this Mac here. It does look a little weird to run this on screen here, but I can 
uh, go in, for example, and turn off my studio lights or turn them back on just like I would on my uh, iPhone, for example. This app doesn't format very well on the Mac screen, but it's usable, so that works. I was also able to load up my Unify control panel for my networking gear in the house. Uh, that seemed to work pretty well also. So there's some things you can definitely do here, but not every app that you run frequently is going to be compatible. So just be prepared for that. Uh, one thing that does work pretty nicely though are games and we can load up uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas here. Again, this is the uh, iPhone or iPad version of it that's going to load up on our screen. I can try to make this full screen here, but it doesn't seem to respond. So this is gonna be pretty much the biggest window I can get it in. And I'm gonna skip this and just resume the game real quick and kind of pick up where I last left off with it. One thing to note is that uh, it's not doing anything special from the control standpoint. So if you don't have a joystick attached, uh, you're going to not be able to play this game at all because typically this would require two hands on the screen. However, I did find for games that are compatible with uh, PlayStation and Xbox controllers that I was able to get those games to work when I have the controller attached via Bluetooth to the Mac. So there are things that you can do uh, to play these games if you have a game controller, but touch controls are going to be pretty much a non-starter for many games, even if they are compatible with the Mac, especially games that require you to have two hands on the screen to control. Now I'm sure some folks are gonna correct me because there is a touch alternative option here that does enable multi-touch on the trackpad. You have to hold down the option key though and it will recognize multiple fingers. But as you can see here, it's a bit of a contortion effort to get uh, everything to work with this game. So it might work well in certain apps, but I think for games, if the game controller doesn't work, you're probably gonna to wanna to stick to your iPhone or iPad. Now what impressed me the most about this new architecture that Apple has put together here is how well it runs Intel software. So we're running Rocket League right now, and this is the Intel version of Rocket League running on the M1, and we're seeing frame rates between about 40 and 60 frames per second most of the time. And I'll show you the settings that I've got here as well so you can get a feel for that. Let me just pull into the menu here and we'll go over to video and you can see we're running at 1080p right now, pretty much in high quality for most of the settings that we've put together. And it's running really, really nice. In fact, this is running so much better than the Intel version of the MacBook Air I reviewed about two years ago. Uh, so it's just remarkable what they've put together here. I'm gonna jump out of the game real quick and go over to the activity monitor and you can see that we are in fact running Rocket League as an Intel app, but it's going through that Rosetta layer and it's translating it over extremely efficiently. And it just gives you an idea as to just how powerful this thing is. And again, it's just barely warm to the touch over here right now as this game is playing. So this is just, again, another example of some real revolutionary stuff going on here with Apple and this chip. And even some crazier stuff here, like the Dolphin emulator, is running pretty much at full speed with uh, most of the games that we have pointed at it. And again, the Dolphin emulator is not yet optimized for the M1 chip, yet we're getting really good performance out of it for a fanless little device. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, so I'm really impressed with what Apple has done here with Intel compatibility. Now, as good as this is at running Intel Mac software, at the moment, there does not appear to be a way to run any kind of Windows stuff on this. I expect that to change in the very near future, given the performance we're seeing out of this. But because this is not running with an Intel processor, you can't simply boot it up into Windows like you can on the existing Intel Macs. So Boot Camp is not an option here. And at the moment, there doesn't appear to be any Windows emulation or virtualization software that you can get for this, but I expect that to change. Now, I paid about $1,500 for the configuration I have here. The lowest cost entry option you've got on the laptop side is this model for $1,000. So it's not a inexpensive laptop, but the performance you're seeing out of this dollar for dollar against an Intel Windows machine is really night and day. And I think this is going to really raise the bar in the PC industry for Intel and AMD and others that wanna get in uh, to up the game, up the performance, up the battery life and lower the noise and heat. And that's something that Apple has done here with uh, their new M1. And this is only the first iteration of the 
Apple Silicon. So we're going to see a lot more as the year progresses here. And I'm looking forward to seeing what maybe the larger MacBook Pro is going to do with some more powerful iteration of this chip. So a lot more to come on this. Even if you're not a Mac fan, I think we're all going to benefit from the competitive edge that Apple has right now with this low powered processor. And I can't wait to see what comes next. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.